Good afternoon. Welcome to Exploring Next Generation Education. Today's topic is Educational Equity and the Science of Reading, What's at Stake. I'm Hiller Spires, Executive Director of the Friday Institute and Associate Dean for the College of Education at North Carolina State University. You know, when I think about how I learned to read many years ago, I have very positive memories and associations. Letter sound correspondence, word recognition and comprehension developed on schedule for me. We know, however, that does not happen for all students. In fact, the North Carolina 2019 NAEP scores indicate that our state is lagging behind in terms of fourth and eighth grade reading. These scores tend to be lower for students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch programs and for some students of color. Unfortunately, children who don't learn to read well often don't perform well in school and have subsequent challenges in post-secondary education and careers. The Excellent Public Schools Act of 2021 puts front and center support for reading excellence and specifically the science of reading. I'm sure our panelists today our audience members and parents and caregivers can agree that we want all children to have access to sound and meaningful reading instruction. We want and depend on a literate society. The purpose of our panel discussion is to explore the relationship between educational equity and the science of reading and to articulate what's at stake as North Carolina educators implement this plan post-COVID. How do we implement this plan? What are the potential outcomes for our children and teachers? And what are the challenges? I'm very excited to have our panelists join us today. They bring unique perspectives about literacy, equity, and reading. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. First, we have Rupin Fafaria. He is the Equity Learning and Differences Reporter at EdNC. Thank you, Rupin, for joining us. Next, we have Dr. Katherine Edmonds, Deputy State Superintendent for the Office of Educational Equity. Katherine, thank you for joining us. And finally, Dr. Dennis Davis. He's an associate professor in the College of Education at NC State, and he's also a UNC literacy fellow. Dennis, thank you for joining us. Ruben, I'm going to start with you. Let me, let me just begin by saying, you know, the ability to read is fundamental to full, partic full participation in our democratic society, and it does serve as a basis for ongoing opportunity and success. You've been covering the story on the science of reading from the beginning. And I might add your video that you created for Ed and C on the intricacies of uh, the reading process is one of the best visuals that I've seen in my career. And it's been a long career. So it's one of the best ones I've seen. As a journalist with a background in law and an understanding of equity, what do you think is at stake as we launch into a new literacy program this year? Well, I'll tell you, um, thank you, first of all, uh, Hiller, and, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here with everybody. Um, I, I, I wanna point out, you know, I, I have not been covering this from since the beginning. There's been efforts for some time. Um, and uh, I started covering this in 2019. And it feels like the beginning because there was a lot of, there were a lot of, uh, you know, move, there was a lot of movement at that time. Um, what's at stake is the question. And my answer, I would, I would posit to you that the very future of our state is at stake. Um, and if you'll allow me, I'd like to share my screen and just talk a little bit about, you know, my perspective and, and how I'm approaching all of this. Sure. And so, Hiller, you, you mentioned the video and this, you know, to anyone who's seen the video, some of this will look familiar. Um, but my journey with all of this begins in, uh, in a classroom. And it was my classroom 
it was my elementary school classroom where, where I met my friend George. Um, I talk about George a lot because uh, he's taught me so much. You know, George, George is black and he's also uh, someone who grew up in poverty with all of its attendant challenges. And we became friends in elementary school uh, because we were the, the two kids that were uh, most often in trouble with, with, with the teacher. Um, we often found ourselves not understanding what was going on in class uh, or not knowing you know, how to do the assignment asked of us. And when the, we'd had enough of the shame and frustration of feeling that way, our emotions manifested as acting out in class. Um, what that meant was that we would be sent to reading timeout. Reading timeout was when we went to the back of the table and the teacher continued um, the instruction for the rest of the class. And what you'll notice is that uh, that's me on the right uh, with the book in my hand, because I had a lot of books growing up. George and I grew up uh, in the same area in neighboring neighborhoods. Um, there weren't bookstores there. Uh, there wasn't a, a library we could, we could walk to. Um, it's what you would call a book desert. But my, my family had the means to drive me to the library, um, to drive me to the bookstore and to buy me books. George didn't have that opportunity. And so when we would be sent to the back of the room, I would uh, go to the shelf and select a book. Um, and I enjoyed reading back there. George didn't, uh, George didn't know how to read. And so he would sit there and at some point he would become frustrated with sitting still. He'd get up and he'd interrupt the class again. Um, and that would be, I mean, a lot of trouble for him, extra trouble for him. The other, the other thing I want you to know about George, um, you know, I didn't understand the word trauma at that time, but I spent a lot of time in the back of the class talking to George um, and playing with him after school. And I understood George's home life was extremely difficult. I understand now that he was dealing with a lot of trauma. For me, I was given a lot of access to opportunity. I did well enough in high school, went to college and later graduated law school. Um, the story was different for George. It went in a different direction. He dropped out, um, still not knowing how to read well, uh, even in high school. And I share, I share this story for a few reasons. The first is to frame for you why I'm so passionate about this issue and why I've decided you know, to dedicate so much of my reporting and storytelling to it. The second is to highlight the inequities, inequities that George didn't bring upon himself, but nevertheless, he had to face. And finally, I share it to highlight the consequences of allowing these inequities to go unattended. George was not served through an equitable lens. And as a matter of fact, I'm not sure how familiar our teachers were with the inequities and the trauma that George experienced. And my journey continues in um, other classrooms. These are more recent times. And this is you know, during my reporting for, for EdNC. And in these classrooms, I continue to learn more about inequities, uh, including you know, the different experiences and challenges, uh, such as for kids whose brains are wired differently, kids who have learning disabilities, and kids uh, who are English learners. And in 2019, when I started, I went into classroom after classroom and felt inspired by the passion of teachers uh, and the engagement from kids who are participating in what I now know uh, were balanced literacy learning strategies. These strategies looked good to me, um, but I was contacted by a group of parents who said, these strategies, they may start out looking like fun and they may start out as fun for the children, but the kids, aren't learning to read. And when you don't know how to learn uh, how to read, as George knew, the fun runs out. Uh, these parents are the ones who introduced me to the science of reading. And I'll pause quickly, just to say quickly about the science of reading. You know, I think it's important, you know, that we be on the same page uh, with what we mean by words. And the term science of reading is used in a lot of ways. It's criticized for what it may or may not include. Um, it can be dismissed as a buzzword. I operate with the definition of the science of reading as what we know from valid, settled, replicated, scientifically-based research, because there are things that we know. Um, there's things that we don't yet know. There's things that were still being researched, um, but there are things that we know. And some of those things are that uh, our, it tells how our, our brains and kids' brains are, are wired to learn how to read. Um, it tells about delivering systematic, explicit, and cumulative phonics instruction. Um, and it tells about the role of 
both decoding and language comprehension in reading instruction. Um, and I'll stay in my lane and not go too far in that so that Dr. Davis and Dr. Edmonds can really talk more about it. Um, but it's an equity issue because what it tells us is that if we have this instruction in core classes, um, that nearly all students can learn to read. Um, and I'll end here just you know, coming back to what is at stake. Um, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. This is what Frederick Douglass said. There are vast gaps among our society that put some groups of people at a disadvantage. Um, to compete in most jobs, literacy is critical. To, to, to navigate most of life, it is important. And education is vital to closing the opportunity gaps, including the reading gap. And it means being intentional about creating environments that affirm all, all of our inherent potential and the inherent potential of every student. Growing strong readers who engage in school and graduate from high school, that may not achieve equity alone, but if we don't do these things, the gap will continue to grow. Thank you, Ruben, we appreciate that. And the story of you and George is so powerful and so illustrative of our conversation today. So thank you for sharing that. I think someone asked the question, um, where can we get your video? And um, I'm gonna ask Heather or either Zach if we can put that link in the chat for our audience, because it is a great video. Yes, Hiller, I've shared that link. Thank you, Heather, appreciate that. Um, next, I'm gonna go to Catherine. Um, Catherine, you're serving in the inaugural role of Deputy State Superintendent for the Office of Educational Equity. And the creation of this role demonstrates uh, how Superintendent Truett and DPI have a commitment to equity. It's clear that literacy is being understood as an issue of equity. Can you tell us from your perspective, how will implementing the science of reading impact equity in North Carolina schools and what the department is doing in that regard? Sure, and, and thank you so much for having me today to be able to share out one, um, the work that the State Board of Education is doing around educational equity, but also Superintendent Truett's vision toward like, what does this look like? And it's called Operation Polaris. Mm -hmm. And we know that equity in education means removing barriers so that all students can reach their academic potential. And when students are strong readers, we know that they're prepared for success in school and life. And having those strong reading skills, they serve as a foundation for future learning and, and they enable students to become strong leaders with a bright future. And so being able to read on grade level by the end of third grade is so important. It's an important milestone. When students enter fourth grade with strong reading skills, they are better positioned for success in the classroom, for high school graduation and readiness for um, college and um, for jobs and, and to get those good jobs as the um, previous presenter shared. And we know through COVID-19 um, that there were inequities that were already in existence and they were magnified um, when COVID hit. And we know that there were some serious challenges um, to equal educational access and opportunities through COVID. And so Superintendent Truett is, um, her vision is Operation Polaris. So looking at, we know that students have lost opportunities for learning during COVID that, that we have some that have lost the, that opportunity and that they were learning through a virtual space that was not our norm. And so her thinking is like, how do we address those inequities that have always been there, but then we're gonna look beyond that. So that moving forward, how do we use the, what we've learned through this pandemic and those innovations that we've seen to address the inequities, inequities that we saw. And so looking at our Office of, of learning, learning Recovery and Acceleration and having a way to share out in our school districts to ensure that they're getting the support through our district and um, regional directors and their support. But then looking at the four satellites that she had that connect with that. And those are human capital, um, 
um, literacy, also looking at student advancement and um, testing in the accountability model that we have. But through all of those pieces, there's one common thread and that thread is equity. And the State Board of Education has done quite a bit of work around equity. The um, strategic plan for the State Board of Education that was adopted in 2019, um, that the foundation of that plan, of their strategic plan is equity in whole child. And so as a state, we have a definition. The State Board of Ed has a definition for equity. And as we are moving out, and that's how this position became into um, fruition, is that in the equity, equity resolution for the State Board of Education, it states that they wanted an equity officer to ensure that all the work of the State Board and of DPI is looked through an equity lens and that we are ensuring not just outside of the agency, but within the agency. So if anyone has been watching with the State Board of Education uh, meetings, we have divisions that have shared their equity and excellence plans. And so our student advancement division has shared their equity and excellence plan. And so when we look at strategic planning across the department, each division is developing that equity and excellence plan that will then push out um, to our school districts. And so in this position, my role is to ensure that one, we're looking through an equity lens, but to ensure that each and every student has an opportunity to reach their full academic potential. And so as we're talking about and looking at the um, science of reading and looking at that work from a student's perspective, I want to now move us to that leadership piece. Former principal, um, I came to this role as um, from the superintendency and we ensured that our teachers were having professional development around literacy. And so we had teachers that were working really, really hard and having those growth opportunities. We had students that were really applying that grit. And, you know, as we say, they were failing forward, they were struggling through text, but we still saw that the reading scores were not moving. And so when we think about the science of reading and we think about what is the approach that we need to take? Well, we need to understand how the brain works and we need to understand what's the best way to educate students in that area um, of literacy. And so as I'm looking at my position and how do we support this work in, and I'm looking at equity um, from the student's perspective, but also from our educator's perspective. So ensuring that we're providing the training and, and this is not just for teachers, this is a systems approach. And, and when I say systems approach, I'm not just talking the K-12 space. When I say systems approach, I'm talking the entire state. Everyone has a part to play. So in the K-12 section of this work, we have to ensure that our, our teachers, our administrators, our central services staff, that everyone has their piece of this. What do they know and need, what do they need to know and be able to do to ensure that we're supporting this work and that, that our educators have access to the training that they need. Mm. But then we have to look at how we preparing um, our educators. So we are in partnership with the educator prep program. So working with higher ed to ensure that these principles and these things, this research that we have around the science of reading, that as we are preparing folks to go into education, that they're going to have that skill set as well. But then there's also a family component to this. And how do we reach out to our families and ensure that we are equipping them to help in this process? But then also looking at our um, at, at, at our community and those who are doing supporting this work and the philanthropists that are helping to fund some of this work, what's that role in it? So when we look at our um, task force, our literacy task force in Operation Polaris, we have a broad spectrum of folks that are at the table that are helping us understand what's the best way to push this out to ensure that we have that access for all school districts and that our teachers are going to get trained, our administrators will be trained, but also looking at our schools that are in the Leandro work. 
So ensuring that we are bringing them in this work as well and equipping um, those school districts and teachers and staff with, with the needs, with the skill sets that they will need to be successful in this work. So this is a um, collaborative effort um, across all stakeholders. And so as we're looking at that equity piece for access to training, we're also thinking about, so what, what do we do if there's turnover in a district? We need to ensure that we have plans in place to fill that gap. Or if we're looking at new staff that are coming into the district, you know, this year for the next few years, we have this push, but we have to ensure that we are allotting for that turnover or for new staff that are coming into the district. And so as I think about our role in ensuring that we're equipping the educators to be able to do the work that, that, that we know needs to be done with students, that's providing that professional development. But also we know that beyond that professional development, if I'm a teacher and I go into my classroom and I start working on something that I'm not as familiar with, that if I hit a bump, that I'm inclined to go back to what I know. So having coaches in the classrooms will be huge for us. And that's a part of the plan to ensure that our teachers will have that in-classroom support. And so when we're looking at implementation, we want to ensure that we're implementing in such a way that one, to support the work as we begin this work, but then to ensure that as we move forward, we are able to, to sustain this work. And you know, I have a very similar story and it's my personal story, but it's in the area of math. And um, I graduated college with a math degree, but failed algebra one in the eighth grade. And I just happened to have a teacher my 10th grade year that recognized the talent. And so when I think about what, you know, my life could have been gone down two paths, but because of Catherine Oakley, I ended up where I am because she was the one that said, you're smart, you're going to college and you're excellent in math. And so having that same support for students, when we look at our multi-tiered system of support and ensuring that our core instruction is meeting the needs of the majority of our students, but then also what do we do when students are not meeting the expectation and having a plan of action in place, ready to go when we hit that bump in the road. So ensuring that our, student, our teachers are equipped with all the skills and tools that they need and that ongoing support. And so when I think about what's at stake, if um, when we look at the science of reading and ensuring that we have effective um, literacy instruction, it's the lives of our, of our children. It's the, the, the future of this state. We have to ensure that we have students that we are preparing to step up and be those leaders for tomorrow. And I'll stop there. Thank you for uh, sharing the vision of the State Board and um, of Department of Public Instruction. And we appreciate that you're in this position and we appreciate your leadership. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Dennis now. And Dennis, you've spent much of your career preparing teachers to teach reading. And um, you've also conducted research on how students learn to read. From your point of view as a researcher, why are many students not reading as well as evidenced by the latest NAEP reading scores? And how will implementing the science of reading impact equity in schools? from your point of view. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Hiller. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. And I'm really glad we're talking about equity and the science of reading in one conversation. I think those things are all too often sort of pitted against each other or not integrated good enough, well enough. So I'm really glad to have this conversation. Um, nothing gets reading researchers worked up like a good conversation about the science of reading. So I decided, I wanna frame my comments around four main points that I think really matter in this conversation, especially if we wanna think about how the science of reading can, um, you know, what it can offer for improving reading instruction in schools. And some of, the, some of my points will um, resonate with different people in different ways, depending on the vantage point that you're coming from. 
Um, so the first point that I want to make is that the term science of reading itself is really ambiguous and imprecise. This has been said a few times already today. Um, but I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, among people who study reading instruction and reading teacher development carefully and rigorously, there is not consensus about what we mean when we say science of reading. In fact, a lot of really smart people, including people who know a whole heck of a lot about scientific evidence in reading, don't even use the term at all or use it very sparingly, precisely because it doesn't have a very clear meaning. One of the other issues with, because this term is so ambiguous and imprecise, a lot of people in my, I have, I fear that a lot of people are sort of using it um, in whatever way they want it to mean, right? It's one of those chameleon terms that can mean whatever you want it to mean. And because it's such a chameleon, um, people have found ways to sort of declare their allegiance to a bumper sticker version of the science of reading to serve interests and agendas that I don't think are actually about reading or about equity. Um, so for example, if you have something to gain from saying that teachers don't know what they're doing, then you can invoke the science of reading slogan to give some gravitas to your point. Or if you have something to gain by saying that universities are terrible places to learn to become a teacher, you can blame teacher educators for not knowing the science behind their content and you'll, you'll get a lot of attention. Or if you're a publisher selling a curriculum product, you can say it's science aligned just to get your foot in the door. And I think these are real problems that we're gonna have to really wrestle with and get a handle on here in North Carolina if we want the science of reading to do good for our children and for our, our, our communities. So having just said a bunch of negative grumpy things about the science of reading doesn't mean I don't like evidence or educational science. Um, in fact, I care a lot about evidence and science, which is why I get so angry about the way it's being used as a weapon. Um, the science uh, does give us a rigorously developed evidence base that should inform the teaching of reading. And this evidence base is spread out across hundreds of journals over decades of research and many, many disciplines that have contributed to this work. It's messy and it's intricate and it's vast. So when I talk about the science of reading today and always, this is the knowledge that I'm talking about. And sometimes to avoid confusion, I, I like to just call it the evidence base for teaching reading, to just sort of skirt the term altogether. So what does the evidence base actually say? So this gets me to my second point. Um, the evidence base for teaching reading makes a few things really clear, but it does leave a lot of unanswered questions. But I think it's helpful um, to kind of lay out, okay, when we say there's an evidence base, what exactly are we talking about? And of course, it's not possible to summarize everything, but when I am pressed to do so, I think there are like 10-ish consistent, robust findings that I think all teachers should know and that should be embedded in all of our conversations about the science of reading. And I'm gonna just quickly fly through these 10 things. I'm happy to like put them on a slide or write them up if you wanna like think about them and scrutinize them more carefully. Um, so children benefit from instruction in phonological and phonemic awareness and alphabetic knowledge. And in fact, they need extreme mastery of these skills, not just familiarity. That's a really important point. Um, we know that kids also benefit from instruction in word level decoding that capitalizes on their ability to pair letters and sounds, i.e. explicit systematic phonics instruction. Um, it's also important, we know that it's not just accuracy of word reading that matters, it's also automaticity. Children need to be able to recognize most words by sight without pausing to think about them. So instructional activities that provide repeated practice with targeted patterns can really help with this. We know that children need frequent opportunities to read connected texts with modeling and teacher feedback and importantly, a sense of purpose. We know that children benefit from explicit instruction in a few evidence-based comprehension strategies also, as well as instruction that helps foster awareness of text structure, especially for expository text, and also explicit instruction in vocabulary. And finally, we know that many of the skills needed to comprehend a text are closely linked to content knowledge and oral language development. Therefore, language-rich instruction that exposes children to new content, academic vocabulary and language structures that are used in written text is really beneficial, along with discussion-based teaching that emphasizes inferential and critical thinking. So if none of these things, so I just gave you a list of like, if you had to summarize the science in two minutes, I put my money on that list. If none of these things sounds controversial, 
guess what? It's because they're not controversial. And that brings me to my third point. There isn't nearly, and some of you will disagree, but I'm going to say it anyway. There isn't nearly as much debate and controversy in reading instruction among knowledgeable people as you may have been led to believe. There's this myth that like there's this science out there, but educators just won't do it. There are some people on the fringes with differing ideas, and there might be a few people who actually believe in whole language somewhere some, in some place. But by and large, the principles that emerge consistently from the evidence are not that contentious. And I'd like once and for all to dispel the myth of the stubborn teacher educator. Teacher educators are not ignoring evidence when teaching pre-service teachers about reading. We are not ignorant whole language evangelists that you may have heard about in some, in some forums. So finally, here's my last point. As much as I love research on reading, and as much as I want every teacher to know the evidence base really well so they can provide the best instruction possible, even I have to admit that the science of reading is not going to save the day. Some people seem to think that if we just stopped being so hard-headed and just did the science, we'd suddenly have every kid reading in no time flat. That's an exaggeration. Getting better evidence-based knowledge and practice into the hands of more teachers is absolutely important. I'm not arguing that point at all. It's super crucial. But there are many, many other factors that are equally or more predictive of reading achievement that schools and teachers cannot address just by embracing the science. To name a few, racial inequities, that's very pertinent for the, today's conversation. Poverty, teacher demographics that don't match the faces of children in classrooms. We, could, we can make a big list of these, right? So I fear that we are putting too much faith in the science of reading, as important as it is, to kind of come out of the clouds wearing a cape and to save the day. It's just not going to happen. Science of reading is the low-hanging fruit in this complex situation. It's easy to legislate science of reading, and it will help, but the problems that we're facing are going to require much more ambitious and creative systemic system-level solution, as our previous um, panelists were talking about. So to recap, those are my four points that I think are important in these conversations. Science of reading is a very ambiguous term itself. We need to be clear about what we actually mean when we're talking about it. The evidence base does make some things very clear, and we really should hold ourselves accountable to those things. And, um, but it's not quite as controversial or debatable as you may think it is among knowledgeable people. And finally, we're not going to be saved by the science of reading. It will do some stuff, but it won't do everything. Thank you, Dennis. We appreciate your synthesis and uh, your uh, bold of perspectives. Um, I wanted to, we only have a, about what, 15, uh, 11 minutes left. And so what I wanted to do was go ahead and open it up to our audience if you have questions you'd like to ask of the panelists. So I'm going to um, see if you want to put some questions in the chat now. So I'll open it up. And I think we have one question here. Um, how does the science of reading address components of criticality? For example, does the science of reading as a theoretical and practitioner approach bridge text and contingent scaffolds to amplify students as critical readers and producers of social, racial, and environmental accountability and justice? Because that's a long question. I think basically um, what Andrea is saying is, um, if you can get at these components of criticality through the definition of the science of reading. I don't know, Dennis, if you have a perspective on that. I, I do, I do. Um, I think it's a really good question. I think um, I think about this a lot and I think it's really, I, you know, I limited myself to four points. The fifth point I wanted to make was that the science of reading isn't, it can't answer every question we need it to answer in as we think about practice um, and I think some of the things that are brought up in Andrea's question are some of those things that you know we might need to rely on um, other epistemologies and other sources of information to help us answer them you'll notice in my list of like the most compelling findings my, my list of 10 I didn't say much about um, you know some things that are very common sense and obvious like making sure kids love to read making sure kids have really cool, fun, interesting books, making sure kids are have exposure to ideas and texts that resonate with their own cultural experiences. Those, just because those things aren't 
inside of the science, the traditional science of reading catalog doesn't mean they're unscientific and it doesn't mean they're not important. Um, in fact, I, I sort of use the analogy, like I don't need a rigorous experimental study to tell me that when I prune my rose bush in my front yard, I need to wear really good gloves. Some things we know are true because they're just so logical and obvious and important that they must be true. And that's, the, that's one of my fears about our current allegiance to this thing we're calling the science of reading. We allow it to create a bucket of stuff that we feel is the only stuff that matters when that's not at all what it's supposed to be, right? It, it can't circumscribe the, the boundaries of the only things that matter. There's a lot of other stuff that matters. And I think that's just really, really, really important to build into policy and the way we talk about evidence. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to so kind of add to that, Healer, yeah, because um, I mm -hmm. agree with Dennis and some of the work that we're doing at the department um, with our path forward work, we're working with six other states. And that is some of the pieces that we're getting at is how do we ensure that the student's background is reflective in the work that we're doing with them? Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that students feel included in this work? Um, our multi-tiered system of support group, they also uh, work with the social emotional side of the, um, the work as well. And so you're absolutely right. It's all of these pieces put together. This is not the magic bullet, but what we do know is that we can't continue to do what we've always done because we'll get what we've always got. Uh, well said, Catherine, appreciate that perspective. Um, I wanted to circle back to something that Rupin uh, alluded to earlier when he was telling his story. Um, Rupin, you were talking about the classroom and you said that um, you used that term, the ba uh, balanced reading, I believe. And you said that, the, um, that it looked good at the beginning, but then it just didn't get the job done. I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, because I know that that is something that people are getting stuck on and that's kind of being a division. Um, some people are using the term balanced reading in, in different ways and I almost feel like it doesn't mean anything now among ed, amongst educators. Do you have any other perspectives on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't want us to get bogged down in, in terminology disclaimers, <laughs> but it's tough, you know, when we're talking on these issues and words or terms come to mean different things. And so, um, you know, when I say balanced literacy, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about, um, you know, as I, I'm, I'm referring to curricula um, that have been sold under that terminology. Okay. Um, and they of course have, you know, some, uh, some roots and, and some whole language approaches. Um, I, I like what Dr. Davis said about, you know, there's not as much disagreement as you would think. Um, as a reporter going into classrooms and talking to teachers, you know, that's evident. Talking to teacher educators, that's evident. Um, when, when coverage of the legislation, you know, this, the, the Excellent Public Schools Act was, was um, occurring, I saw a lot of people say that, hey, we, we wanna start teaching phonics. And I never went into a room whether they were using whole language balance literacy, you know, they all taught phonics. Mm. It's, this was more, um, you know, a commentary on the practices that I was seeing. And some of these practices, um, you know, they skip steps and they might even impede, um, you know, reading development. If, mm -hmm. if, if, if students come to rely on um, looking at pictures and then looking at a word and what letter does it start with? And then, you know, surmising what word they're reading. Well, those aren't, you know, you don't have the same, it's not, the same synapses aren't firing, you know? And, you know, humans are built, we're, we're built to be efficient. When, when my kids were born, um, the doctors warned us, you know, if we wanted to um, breastfeed the babies, that we shouldn't introduce the bottle because the bottle, the milk will come out real quick and then they won't wanna go back, you know? To, and so, because we, we like things to be, to come quickly and efficiently. And if, um, if all we do is look at a picture and then try to guess at a word, you know, we, 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 can, we can tend to rely on um, an ineffective method. And we're skipping a very important process of, of orthographically mapping um, words and, and learning how to learn new words that we've never been taught. Um, 
I kind of lost the question in all of that. Oh, that's all right. I was just trying to, I, I just know that there has been certainly discussion around the science of reading and then the balanced reading got thrown in with that and people are defining that differently. So I, I heard you use the phrase and so I just wanted to, you to unpack that a little bit and I think you did. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna go to a question from Susan Osborne. She's talking about the role of trauma and stress. And she says, cortisol impairs the brain's ability to focus. So how do we address this systemic problem that impacts some students way more than others? Uh, poverty, ability of parents to support their children, violence, those kinds of things. I mean, that is, that's a, a large issue which we have alluded to. I don't know if anyone wants to take that. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. And so when we, those are the things that we also address currently. So when we say science of reading, it doesn't mean that you let all those pieces go and all of that work that you know is the right things to do because you have students that are have trauma, but after the pandemic or during this pandemic, we have adults that have trauma. And so we still have to think about how do we address the whole child and the state board's strategic plan adopted the whole child in equity. And they define both of those as well as their the foundation of, of their strategic plan. So we're not saying, you know, let go of all those things that we know are the right things to do for students. That is a part of this work. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's say we might have time for one more question. Um, Jennifer uh, is agreeing with Rupin's comment. Um, it's a good example of what this type of instruction can lead to. I think she's giving a, a YouTube example. Sometimes this looks good to parents and teachers at first because the children sound like they're reading. However, they're learning ineffective strategies that reading for reading and wasting their time. Uh, this is very common practice across schools and the curricular materials being used. So it sounds to me like with the new emphasis and the instruction that, that is going to be rolled out in, uh, for early reading, that that will be addressed. Would you agree, Catherine? Trying to find my mute button. Yes, I, I do agree that, um, and, and we know that this has the potential to become the buzzword or, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's on board now and it looks great and we see those gains. And then we start, um, as one of the other presenters said, I can't remember, but talked about skipping steps. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important that we have those um, coaches that will be in the classroom with the teachers to support them so that this, this is not the, the quick, let's get it done. And we're going to see these results and we're just going to keep moving. It, this is going to take some time. Right. This is one that this is a way of doing business that we, it, it will take time. It, it, it's not, as you said earlier, the magic bullet, but understanding by research, how can, how students learn to read and then what are some effective strategies to support that. And we just have to make sure that we have that piece of, in place for sustainability and how we provide support to our, to our educators. And notice I didn't say just to our teachers, this takes everyone mm -hmm. understanding. Right. Um, I wanna close out, Candy Bill wants to know, Rupin, what happened to George? So maybe we'll go full circle. Do you yeah. have any insights on George? I, I get this question a lot. And um, the, the, the short answer is, I don't know where George is right now. I have been looking for him. Um, uh, ninth grade was 29, 29 years ago for me. And um, I, I heard about George and knew about his whereabouts for several years after, um, after he dropped out. And life didn't get any easier for him. I don't want to uh, go into too much detail, but he, a lot of the questions that we're getting, you know, I think about George a lot. Science of reading, whatever we mean by that, any 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 initiative to improve reading instruction so very important but all of that none of it can come before you know reaching the child you know um, knowing the child and George came into the classroom with so much trauma um, I look at teachers and I and I have so much respect for for many of the teachers that I see today where they they ask questions about their students you know they ask if they're hungry you know, they, they, they don't ask them to write about 
you know, what they did over the summer. They, they give options about what they want to write about mm-hmm. because we have to get to know the kids and, and then everything else can, can start. Um, and so I want to know what happened to George and I'm, I'm hoping that there's a happy ending for his story. Thank you. You know, I'm so excited that um, we've had this short amount of time to surface these different issues and for uh, three experts from different sectors to hear each other, listen to each other, and to surface such important issues around this topic. And I have to say, I'm very encouraged and excited for uh, the work before us in our state. you know, we have a vision for North Carolina that all students can read and read well. So I hope that we will all pull together to make this vision a reality and we'll do whatever we all need to do to uh, support our educators and to support our Department of Public Instruction and teacher educators, everyone, because as Catherine said, it takes everyone to pull together to impact a system the way we have it right now. And I'm going to close with an excerpt from Amanda Gorman's inspiration poem, The Hill We Climb. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I hope that we can all be the light in supporting our educators as they engage students to be strong readers. We know the stakes are high as we've heard here today. So thank you for joining us. Please let us hear from you by taking our survey and take care everyone. Have a good day.